The German election has delivered a clear, if somewhat confusing, snapshot of the changing political landscape of the country. No government as yet. The SPD won the most votes, but the very narrow margin of victory means the CDU could also be aiming to form a coalition government. As negotiations begin, let's walk you through the numbers with our election analyst, William Glucroft. That's right, we have two parties basically saying they have a right to form a coalition and be that next government after Angela Merkel. Let's see just how right they are. Let's look at these results on the screen, our top parties. We have the SPD center-left coming out on top at 25.7% of the vote, followed by less than two percentage points by the CDU-CSU conservative bloc. Remember, that's Angela Merkel's party that's been in power for, much, for almost the last 16 years. Keep an eye on these third and fourth parties, these ones in the middle, the Greens and that yellow bar, the liberal FDP party, the Free Democrats. These two are most likely going to be the ones to allow either the center-left or the center-right to actually form that government. There's going to be a lot of horse trading going on, a lot of maneuvering, a lot of negotiating. Socialists left, they're lucky to even be in the Bundestag at all, failing to meet that 5% threshold that you need to get into the Bundestag, but they have enough direct candidates to have a few seats, and the AFD have been ruled out of working with any other party given their far-right views. Now, this is only a partial picture. Let's look at the pluses and minuses. Who actually won and lost in comparison to the 2017 election? Well, it can't be clearer. The CDU-CSU conservative bloc, they are down a historic nine percentage points. They are at an all-time low, whereas the SPD overall also scoring very low, but they're up 5% from their 2017 performance, and the Greens are having an all-time high right now, almost 6% natural allies there, the center-left and the Greens, but the center-right is going to be doing a lot to try to woo the Greens and the yellow party there, you see, the Free Democrats to try to form a coalition. Now, voting turnout? in Germany is usually very high. Let's see if it was as high as it often is. Here it is now, 77% was the turnout, it looks like. Not as high as it's been in the last few election cycles, but also not as low, a very solid 77%. Germans are not required to vote, but they do like to turn out and show their ballot and make their voice heard. That's uh, William Glucroft. Now, German voters now face a prospect of months of uncertainty as parties enter into coalition talks. So let's take a closer look at how we got here. After a tight race, the final results brought clarity. Olaf Scholz and his Social Democrats edging a small but definite lead over the Conservatives. It's a breathtaking turnaround for a party that only a few months ago many had written off. But the SPD won't be able to govern alone. Their leader made it clear who his favorite partners would be. The voters made it very clear. They told us that we should form the government. They strengthened three parties, the Social Democrats, the Greens and the FDP. And that is the obvious mandate by voters that these three parties should lead the next government. The Social Democrats won't be the only party trying to win allies. Despite leading the Conservative Party of outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel to their worst ever result, the CDU Chancellor candidate Armin Laschet didn't concede his party's right to govern. No party can derive a mandate to govern from this result. That also applies to the SPD. The election campaign is now over and no one can act as though they alone can decide who will form a government. And that's why talks with potential partners are now necessary. But it looks as though the Conservatives won't be getting first dibs in such talks with the two smaller parties. In their post-election press conference, the Greens co-leaders indicated that it would be the Social Democrats they would turn to first. There's a certain logic to talking to the SPD and the FDP now. That doesn't mean that we rule out talking to the Conservatives. The other would-be kingmakers, the business-friendly FDP, even went as far as to suggest that they would speak to the Greens before approaching either of the two main parties. 
Whatever the outcome of the coalition talks, it looks like the new government in Berlin will be made up of three parties. An arrangement that is unprecedented at the national level of German politics. After the last general election four years ago, negotiations dragged on for over four months. Scholz promised that with him in charge, there would be a speedier resolution. My idea is that uh, we will be very fast in getting a result for this uh, government and it should be before Christmas if possible. Until then, Angela Merkel will continue to hold the fort. Her time in office extends until a new chancellor is ready to take over. Well, let's talk through the horse trading with DW Chief Political Correspondent Melinda Crane. Welcome, Melinda. Um, seems like a big promise there, Olaf Scholz, saying he can do a deal by Christmas. Do you think he can? Well, if we look at his own personal uh, characteristics, he is a very experienced politician. He has been part of coalition negotiations before, and he's a pragmatist. So all of those would count in his favor, favor in terms of can he do a deal. He does, however, have a very divided party. And one of the big questions will be that their party was unusually united during the election campaign, with the left-leaning uh, wing of the party essentially uh, biting their tongues and biding their time. The question is for how long and whether the election of uh, nearly 50 young uh, socialists, young representatives of the Social Democratic Party will try to put on the pressure and exact a price, because that will make it a lot harder for Olaf Scholz to make offers to the market-friendly uh, Free Democrats. Yeah, let's talk about the, 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 the two likely uh, suitors then, the, 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 the FDP, the Free Democrats, uh, and the Greens, who are waiting to see what, what they could be offered. What do they want? What will they want in order to throw their lot in with one side or the other? Anna Elena Baerbach has made it crystal clear. She wants to see climate change put at the absolute front and center of the next government uh, uh, program. Uh, She's the Greens uh, chancellor candidate, absolutely no longer chancellor candidate now, of course, but uh, uh, the party leader together with Robert Habeck. And they've both said, we have to see uh, getting ahead of the climate crisis as a theme that runs through everything we do in the next government, from transport to how we uh, organize the schools and uh, how we organize social welfare programs uh, and uh, how we uh, begin to better price energy and, and, and. So that's very clear, and they have said so. Now, the FDP claims that it also wants to move forward on tackling uh, the climate crisis, but they want to do so in a business-friendly way that doesn't saddle Germany with a lot of debt and doesn't uh, require the government to raise taxes. In other words, they want to keep costs down, which has led the SPD's left-wing leader, Kevin Kunat, uh, to say this is voodoo economics. It's not going to work. So there you already see the kind of challenges that these uh, negotiations, if they even become formal negotiations. At this point, we're talking only about mm. exploratory talks, but that's the kind of choices that they will face, the kind of trade-offs uh, that will be at stake. And essentially, it's going to very much come down to a choice between more state or more market. OK, stay with us, uh, Melinda. We're going to bring uh, uh, election analyst William Gluecroft uh, in. He's going to talk us through some of the shifts in voting patterns. That's right. Uh, there's just so much to talk about, about who voted for whom in this election. Let's have a look. We were just talking about Greens, CDU, where everyone kind of falls. Let's look at the FDP first, these liberal Democrats. Who voted for them? Young people. Young people voted for the liberal Democrats. The largest portion of their voters are 18 to 24 year olds, including those first time voters, 18 year olds. And it goes down in, 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 in order there to older voters. It seems like younger people are really, it's really resonating with them. The FDP's kind of calls for digitalization and more innovation in business and these kinds of things. We heard it already from the FDP that they are the future, that they are the smaller parties are where younger people want to go to. And we can see that also with the Greens. The Greens had a very similar result as well. Again, the younger voters are coming out to vote for the smaller parties. They're not thrilled with the bigger parties uh, on either the center right or the center left. You can see also here, start going from youngest to oldest, most to least. Obviously, 
the Greens' message of environment, of climate, resonating very strongly with young people as well. Now, one of the other big things to talk about is voter migration. Who stole votes from whom? This is one of my favorite things to look at because it shows just how clear the shifting landscape is here in Germany. Just to show you one example, the CDU, CSU, that center-right bloc that's been in power for almost the last 16 years under Angela Merkel, they lost more than 1.5 million votes to the center-left, going from the center-right to the center-left. They also lost 920,000 voters to the Greens and 490,000 voters to the Liberal Free Democrats. That is a message to the CDU, CSU, that they have some issues with their voter base. And if it weren't for Germany skewing old, which tends to support the center-right, that they would be, might be even, even bigger trouble than they are right now. Well, William, thank you for that. Fascinating figures. Uh, Melinda Crane is uh, still with us. Let, let's talk about that voter migration, uh, Melinda. Um, one and a half uh, million voters leaving the CDU to, to going to the SPD. Why? This is the inevitable end of the big tent era, you could say. The Social Democrats and the Conservatives, uh, Angela Merkel, CDU, plus its Bavarian sister party, the CSU, they used to be seen as the people's parties. They were parties that had 30, 40 percent uh, each of the overall vote. That era is now definitively over. Angela Merkel had taken her Conservative Party toward the middle of the political spectrum. She had blurred the boundaries between left and right, and there Therefore, kept the Conservatives uh, sort of as a big tent party, perhaps past uh, the natural lifetime of that kind of a party. But it's over now. Armin Laschet made it very clear during the campaign, especially when he designated his so-called team for the future, and it included uh, a, a party elder who's known for his free market ideology, Friedrich Merz, that he would be taking the party back toward the right. And therefore, you see this mass migration of voters who perhaps perhaps liked Angela Merkel's middle-of-the-road politics, who say, nope, this is not the party for me anymore, and therefore, and also probably objected to Armin Laschet as chancellor candidate, and therefore moved to the SPD, and then another big batch of them to the Greens. Fascinating indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Melinda uh, Crane, DWG political correspondent. For now, thank you so much. Well, now let's look at the possible effects of these changes on transatlantic relations. Uh, Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff is vice president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Welcome to DW. Um, even without knowing its final outcome, has this election and the prospect of a chancellor who is not Angela Merkel changed the country's uh, position internationally? Well, that's a little early to, uh, to tell because we don't even know what the coalition will look like. But there are some constant, of course, in the in the German uh, the geography of the political landscape. Uh, all four parties that could potentially form the coalition, that includes the two uh, bigger ones, the Christian Democrats and Social Democrats, support the basic uh, underlying structure of German foreign policy with strong transatlantic relations with a European devotion, with a commitment to more European integration. I, I don't think any of this is going away with this, uh, with this election, but there are a number of smaller uh, to medium-sized changes that we might be, uh, might be seeing, uh, especially on China policy, depending on what type of coalition it is on defense spending and NATO. Uh, so there are changes but there are not architectural changes. Yeah. Let's talk, let's pick up one of those points, um, that defence spending. We know that NATO has long been a cornerstone of German political policy. We also know, I'm going to put no in, in quotation marks, that the, the Greens are likely to be part of the next uh, German government. And they're not so keen uh, on, on uh, increased military spending towards NATO. So what changes are we likely to see there? Um, the 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 next coalition, as you say, will include the uh, the Greens. Uh, we know that they have been interestingly pretty hawkish when it comes to uh, China relations and Russia relations, based on their uh, on human rights policy. But they are hesitant to back up these claims with hard power. 
Now, they've done a pretty interesting trick in the preparation for, for this election within their, within their party. They've rejected the 2% goal, uh, claiming it will uh, increase the, the percentage when uh, the economy goes down as a, as a nonsensical goal. But it doesn't mean that they're not willing to increase the defense budget. Olaf Scholz, the likely chancellor, if it, if it comes to that, um, has, has said multiple times during the campaign that he stands by doing what he has done during his time as finance minister, uh, moderately increasing uh, the defense budget. So that will not please the Americans because we're not getting to 2% uh, in, uh, in a couple of years. But the trajectory, I think, will remain the same. And even the Greens will not, uh, will not change that, tra uh, that trajectory upward in defense spending. The 2% that you're talking about, of course, being the 2% of GDP that has been set as a sort of bar for uh, NATO entry from its, from its members. Um, China, you, you mentioned there as a, as a potential a point of, uh, of, of friction. Do you, where do you see that happening? How do you see that playing out? Well, first of all, I think Xi Jinping is, 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 is changing the perception of China in this country, and he is thus uh, playing a part in, uh, in changing uh, slowly changing, I would have to say, uh, a China policy. The assertiveness, wolf warrior diplomacy, the whole, uh, the whole behavior during COVID, the ambition uh, that China, uh, reaching into Europe, all of this uh, reaches the German population, makes it uh, uh, uneasy. So Xi Jinping is the first player here. The second player is Angela Merkel. She is now and will be in a couple of months going off the scene. And she sort of was a holdout of an, of an old China policy, of a, of a policy that still built on, 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 on relative to, uh, a relative openness to, uh, towards China, China trade, and trying not to get into uh, the thick of a confrontational attitude towards China. She has been pushing back against all those who tried to take a more distant, even a more hawkish approach on China. She's gone, and that will change the policy. And thirdly, the third element that will change that is uh, Joe Biden and American uh, positioning here. Germany will would feel uneasy being left behind in the convoy of Western nations. It won't probably be out front in terms of hawkishness vis-a-vis -vis China, but he also doesn't want to be left behind. So I could see subtle changes or, or a, a, a little bit of a step dance in China policy going forward. Thank you so much for that. That's very clear. Uh, Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Thank you. Well, there's uh, lots to take away from this election in terms of what it reveals about the changing uh, political landscape within Germany. But what comes next will also determine the country's uh, role as a leading power in the European uh, Union. So let's bring in DW Brussels uh, Bureau Chief, Alexandra von Naaman. Uh, welcome, Alexandra. Uh, what are the preferences uh, as far as Brussels is concerned? A Chancellor Scholz or a Chancellor Laschet? Well, I think that Brussels could work with both of them because both politicians are diehard Europeans. Um, as Merkel's vice chancellor and finance minister Olaf Scholz is, of course, well known here. He's also known as someone who is in favor of more European sovereignty when it comes to industrial policy, defense, and uh, climate protection. But Armin Laschet is also someone who says that uh, um, Germany. Germany needs a strong, a stronger Europe. Uh, he is a promoter of the Franco-German friendship and he served as a member of the European Parliament. So he's also well known here. And I think that the main takeaway uh, from that German election is for Brussels that all the parties that could end up in a government are a deeply pro-European. What is not so good for Brussels is that it seems uh, that coalition talks uh, will take a while 
and this is not good news for Brussels because, of course, as long as Germany doesn't have a government, uh, little will move forward in the European Union. Right. So, uh, so what are the main tasks that Germany's next chancellor will have to face in terms of European politics? Well, I think that very high on the agenda is fighting climate change. The European Commission has introduced a quite ambitious climate package, and now it is up for member states to agree on that. And, of course, Germany is here needed to search for possible compromises. And another very important issue on the agenda is, is uh, the post-COVID economic recovery and the question whether the quite strict uh, fiscal rules that are now suspended because of the pandemic should be relaxed in the future. And here you can see that uh, differences between parties do matter because I think we can assume that Social Democrats and the Greens, they would support that, while the Merkel's Conservatives and the Free Democrats um, are very sceptical. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Brussels Bureau Chief Alexander von Norman. And what about Russia? I asked DW's Moscow bureau chief, uh, Yuri Reschetto, what path German-Russian relations are likely to take now. Well, uh, Phil, at least that's what the Kremlin hopes for. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov stressed that Moscow seeks continuity when it, when it comes to German-Russian relations. He admitted that the two countries will still have their differences, but said he hoped that Russia and Germany would be united in the belief that problems can and should be resolved through dialogue. Mm -hmm. Actually, the main election result for the Kremlin is that Germany won't have a chancellor from the Green Party. That was a bit of a fear here. Uh, that the Kremlin had, especially because Germany and Russia have such close economic ties. The Greens are the only major political force in Germany that demands not only that sanctions against Russia continue, but in particular that the Nord Stream 2 gas project, for example, should be stopped. And the pipeline is a very important issue for Moscow. Uh, also, uh, it's not yet clear what coalition will be in the German government. A Green politician could still become foreign minister, and that could be tough for the Russians, as the Greens declared human rights to be the most important issue on the German-Russian agenda. But at the same time, the influence of the Greens on Germany's new foreign policy will most likely be limited, especially because all the other members of a possible coalition government, the Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats and the Free Democrats, in general, rely on a dialogue with Russia. None of these parties want a radical break with the Kremlin. Right. So, so what challenges are, are Merkel's successors likely to have in dealing with Russia? Well, I think, uh, ideally, he should speak, uh, speak Russian, like Angela Merkel did, to be the next so-called putin versteher which translates from German as a Putin understander. I'm joking, of course. I think that uh, Russian-German relations are so close and so diverse uh, that Merkel's personal relationship with Putin wasn't the only decisive factor. Uh, Germany is too important for Russia, and President Putin will continue to try to work closely with, with whoever becomes chancellor. But when it comes to challenges, uh, Vladimir Putin's foreign policy actually has some basic principles that are quite easy to understand, even for people who don't belong to the category for Putin, of putin -Fashteer. On the one hand, Putin stands for taking a tough stance against the West to assert Russia's importance in the world stage, on the world stage, and that's something the new chancellor has to be, keep in mind. On the other hand, Putin needs Germany as an important member state within the EU as a country which has very close economic ties with Russia. And Russia Russia remains an important partner for Germany, not only economically, but, for example, on the subject of security as well. Moscow uh, has close contacts with uh, Central Asia, with the former Soviet republics, which in turn have a long border with Afghanistan. And because of its influence on Afghanistan, Russia can also be very useful right. for the German government. OK. Uh, DW Bureau Chief uh, Yuri Reschetto in Moscow, thank you so much.